Good morning and good afternoon, depending on where you live. Uh, my name is Larry Hoffheimer, and I am the chairman and founder of the Micrody Generation Association. Uh, we are pleased to present a, a series of educational seminars on many eye related conditions uh, with a special focus on macular degeneration and low vision. Uh, I want to first thank our sponsors, uh, Novartis Pharmaceutical, uh, Regeneron Pharmaceutical, and Nodal Vision. And you'll hear about those companies later. Uh, today, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Micro Degeneration Association. Uh, I founded this organization about 12 years ago uh, out of a concern that I had uh, following my mother's uh, progression to macular degeneration uh, to the point that she became uh, totally independent, uh, dependent and lost her entire central vision. It, it did indeed affect the quality of her life. And you should also know back then, which is a, over 20 years ago, uh, they did not have some of the uh, eye-saving or vision-saving uh, therapies like uh, the, the eye injections, uh, the anti-veg injections. So all that being said, uh, I want to recommend, or I'd like to point you to our website, uh, macular degeneration uh, hope.org. Uh, that shows you all our future uh, uh, conferences like this, and you can sign up for them at, at no, no charge. Uh, I also want to uh, talk that uh, remind you that there's a survey available uh, at the close of the program that takes about three minutes to complete, and it helps us uh, serve your interests better. So our speaker today is an outstanding uh, contributor to the vision field. Uh, his name is uh, Richard uh, Schuldiger, and he is uh, the founder and of International Academy of Low Vision Specialists, uh, in which he did it, founded in 2006. He is a low vision uh, diplomat, emeritus in the American Academy of Optometry, and president of the International Academy of Low Vision Specialists. All of the members of the Academy have uh, received extensive advanced training in low vision care, uh, uh, mostly uh, many by Dr. Schollinger. Uh, he founded the, and was clinical director of the New York Lighthouse uh, in upstate New York and low vision services uh, in White Plains. It's now my distinct pleasure to introduce to you, Dr. Richard Schollinger. Okay, good morning, everyone. I'm here in California, so it's uh, nine o'clock in the morning and uh, happy to have questions uh, as you have them. I'll answer them as they come up, but there are things that uh, I want to impart to you, some information about uh, low vision, about strange abnormal abnormalities in cases that I've seen. We're gonna talk about Charles Bonet syndrome this morning. We're gonna talk about uh, other things like geographic atrophy and hemianopsia, things like that. So I am a low vision optometrist. For those of you who don't understand what low vision and low vision optometry is all about, low vision we define as vision which is insufficient to do what you wanna do. Uh, obviously fully corrected vision. So if with your glasses, your contact lenses, surgery, any which way uh, conventional treatments for vision is still insufficient to allow you to do the things you want to do, then you have what we call low vision. And a low vision optometrist like myself, we're uh, trained to work with you and figure out ways that you're gonna be able to do what you wanna be able to do. So with macular degeneration, you understand that there is central vision loss. So there's two types, actually many types of vision loss, but central vision loss is macular degeneration. You lose your ability to actually see detail. 
if, if you're not familiar with the macular, what macular is, imagine yourself in your room as an eyeball and uh, the walls are, you're actually sitting inside your eyeball. The walls of that room would be wallpapered with what we call the retina. So light comes in through the window and it tips the wallpaper, which is retina. And then it gets sent to the back of the head where the, the vision uh, is located. And then you can see. There's one spot on the, on the uh, retina uh, that's about the size of a, uh, a wall clock that has only cone cells instead of rods and cone cells. And they're very, very much packed together. And um, that's where you get your best detailed vision. And that's called the macular. And when that degenerates, you lose your central vision. So when people lose vision, one of the weird things that happens to some people is that the brain forms images uh, because it just doesn't know what to do with that loss. Now, we're not really sure exactly why that happens, and that's called Charles Bonnet syndrome. We're not exactly sure why that happens. Some think that even though the cells of the macula are damaged, somehow there's still signals being sent from that area to the brain along the optic nerve, and since the brain doesn't quite know what to do with them, it just forms an image. Uh, and others think that just because of the loss, the brain is, has really just does not know what to do, and so it forms images. But in any case, there really is nothing we can do about it. It's a shame. But people actually do see images. They may see people, they may see animals, they may see pictures on the wall. Uh, there's a whole lot of different possible things that they could see uh, that are not there. Um, I've had people explain to me they only see them at night. I've had people see them, tell me they only see them during the day. There's really no explanation for the visual hallucinations that are there, uh, but unfortunately uh, they are, and there's no medication, there's no surgery, there really is nothing that we can do about those images. Most of the time, we can help macular degeneration patients with their central vision loss to see better. Uh, if we make things larger and the image falls outside of that damaged area, then you'll be able to see it. So for the most part in low vision with macular degeneration patients, we use magnification. We wanna make things larger. So you know now if you're watching TV and you have central vision loss, if you get closer to the television set, you see it better. If you get closer to a person's face, you see it better. If you bring, bring your reading material closer, it's not better because it's out of focus. So one of the things we can do is we can make very, very strong reading glasses. Now you may have to hold it closer and closer, but the closer it is, the bigger it looks and the easier it is to see. So low vision doctors are skilled in using very strong optics, stronger than most uh, primary air, uh, eye care doctors use so that you can read. We also use telescopes. If you hold up a pair of binoculars, things look bigger and closer. Well, we can do that in a pair of glasses. We can do that in a number of ways. We can make a very large pair that takes up the whole lens so that if you wanna watch TV, you can see the entire TV. There are some people who have pretty good uh, peripheral vision and are still able to drive, but can't read the signs and can't see the traffic lights. So they just need a small little telescope to be able to see that. And we can put that very much on the top of the lens, out of the way, kind of like your mirrors in the car out of the way. And you look in the rear view mirror when you wanna see what's behind you. Well, you can look through the telescope when you wanna read the sign. So we can do something like that. That's called a bioptic telescope. Um, if you're in the grocery store and you need to read a, a uh, label or a price tag, well, a hand magnifier works very well. 
it's very difficult to buy a hand magnifier on your own. I've seen patients who come in with a bag of 10 or 12 hand magnifiers and all look different and yet have the same lens in them. So if one doesn't work, they all don't work. So when we do a low vision evaluation, we figure out exactly how much magnification is necessary. And then we can order the correct hand magnifier. You walk through the grocery store and you open it up and, and see exactly what you need to see. So for the most part, low vision devices, low vision glasses, as you can tell from what I've said, are task specific. So a bioptic telescope for driving will work basically for that or for going to sporting events and seeing uh, the field. I have a pair myself when I go to football and baseball games, uh, they work very well, but they're not gonna work for reading. A uh, hand magnifier is gonna work very well in a grocery store, but it's not gonna work very well if you wanna watch a sporting event. Okay, so, uh, and then there are some strange things like we'll call geographic atrophy. There are times when there is a, a, a little bit of a vision loss with the macular and a large surrounding round vision loss around the macular. So I've had patients come in and say, well, I can't read. And when I measure their, what we call their visual acuity, their ability to see the chart, they do pretty well. That's because they've got a very small little area that's good surrounded by a bad area. And what happens is as we make things bigger and magnify, the image actually falls onto a bad area. So this is a case where when we make things bigger, things actually get worse. And with patients like that, sometimes we have to use tremendous amounts of magnification. And sometimes we have to figure out just the right amount to get it in that good area that they have. So these are some of the uh, issues that we run into when we do a low vision evaluation. Okay, so one of the questions that I'm seeing right here on my screen, somebody wrote, my mom has lost vision due to macular degeneration. Okay, I understand that. I've seen that 10,000 times. I've been a low vision optometrist for over 40 years. And uh, I speak to every single patient on the phone before I make an appointment. So I've heard that many times. Her retinist doctor said, there's nothing that can be done. Uh, I cannot explain to you how infuriated I get when I hear that, because what they mean is there's nothing that they can do medically, but they don't understand that there's things that can be done visually. She has trouble reading. Where can I go to get her help? So the answer is very simple. You go to Dr. Google on your uh, browser and type in low vision, low vision help, low vision information. The key words are low vision. And there should come up many low vision doctors in your area. Now, one of the problems we have in the field of optometry is that we're not allowed to call ourselves specialists. So even though I've been doing low vision for 40 years and I only do low vision, I obviously have a lot of experience as a, uh, an optometrist, we can't call ourselves a specialist. Uh, so that becomes a little difficult. So you really have to get on the phone and call offices and ask them, do you fit bioptic telescopes? Do you fit uh, spectacle telescopes? Do you fit microscopes? Uh, and if the answer is they don't know what you're talking about, then they're not a low vision doctor. You can also go to the website of my organization, the International Academy of Low Vision Specialists. So you can go to lowvisiondoctors.com and uh, find a, a low vision doctor. And uh, most of our doctors will talk to you on the phone before making the appointment. Some want to make an appointment, just have the patient come in and see what they can do. Uh, where should I go? Uh, There's another question. Where should I go to find a low vision doctor? or low vision rehabilitation. I just answered that question, so we have that. Uh, another question here is, my aunt thinks she is going crazy. She says there are people in the room, but there's no one there, what's happening? Well, that is Charles Bonet syndrome. Uh, she's not going crazy. She actually does see people in the room. The brain is where vision takes place, not in the eye. The eye is the receiver but the image then gets transferred from the eye to the brain. 
So this is a, an issue um, because the brain is not receiving anything. It needs to fill in. And so it fills in from memory. It may fill in people that she knows. It may fill in people that she doesn't know. Uh, but she unfortunately is not, uh, not crazy. She is actually seeing the images. Uh, how that she can go about knowing uh, whether the image is real or not. I wish I had an answer. And every other low vision eye doctor wishes we had an answer, but we don't, unfortunately. Okay, and then there's a question here about the implantable telescope. Would this be helpful? So that's a good question. I'm not sure it's still available, but if it is, let's talk about it. Uh, the question has been, why can't we put a telescope, a little telescope in the eye? And the answer is you can. It's called the implantable telescope. It's beneficial to some people, but you have to understand a few things. One is they will only put the telescope in the poorer eye. The second thing you have to understand is that you'll be seeing one large image and one small image. So that means you're gonna see double. And it takes a good few months, maybe up to six months before your brain can distinguish which one to use at any given time. Um, so personally, I prefer a telescope in a pair of glasses because then I can simply take them off when I don't wanna use them. Um, there are also very strict rules on who is allowed to have an implantable telescope. Uh, at this point, I think you cannot have had cataract surgery. I know the company was trying to get it approved for people who have already had cataract surgery to take out the implant that's there and put in an implant, the telescope. But as far as I know, it's still that you have not had cataract surgery yet. And so, of course, most macular degeneration patients have already had cataract surgery. And then there are some rules on how much vision the good eye and the bad eye have to have for that implantable telescope. I hope that answers the question. Are there tools that can help with the vision that I have left? So the answer is yes. Um, somebody asking about having images. So hold on just one second here. Because I happen to have a pair of glasses that I can show you for a particular patient that's coming in uh, actually tomorrow. And uh, he wants to be able to read and see his music at approximately uh, 18 inches away. And so we made him a pair of telescope glasses and here they are. And we put the telescope glasses on the bottom and aim down, uh, but relatively a little bit straight and a little bit down so that his music can be in front of him and, uh, and he can then play his piano. So here's what the glasses look like. And we designed these very, very specifically. You can perhaps see here that they're aimed inward, they converged for a particular distance, they're focused for a particular distance. And so this is a man who plays instruments and he has difficulty uh, reading his music. And he wants to, I mean, he could of course uh, enlarge the music, but uh, he says he works you know, with a band and, and they pick out music and hand it to him and he wants to be able to see it. Um, this is a pair of glasses that looks kind of normal. They're yellow lenses, and one would think, well, what's the, you know, so, so what? But these are actually a little bit different. These are called E Scoop, E Scoop, S C O O P. Not uh, well known in the field. Uh, a man in Holland developed these. There's a particular curve to the lens that's different than normal glasses. There's a particular thickness to the lens that's different than normal glasses. This particular yellow is very, very specific in filtering out very specific wavelengths of light and only certain wavelengths through. So 
I have found in using these that some patients find them extremely helpful in cutting down glare and improving contrast. And it magnifies just enough to make things a little bigger and easier to see. So people are asking about are there tools? Yes, these are some of the tools that can be used in order to uh, make a person see. Okay, so one person's asking, they look heavy, are they? Well, yeah, they are a bit heavy. And so in a low vision evaluation, so for example, when I do a low vision evaluation, the first thing I do is talk to people on the telephone. Nobody gets an appointment uh, with me until I speak to them on the phone. Why? Well, first I wanna get a sense of how much vision they have. Remember that the, um, the definition of low vision is vision, which is insufficient to do what you wanna do. So the first thing I need to know is how much vision do you have? So I'll ask questions of the patients. Can you read the newspaper? If you can't read the newspaper, uh, can you read with a magnifying glass? Well, if you can read with a magnifying glass, whatever the level of that magnifying glass is, I can put it into a pair of glasses. If you can read with the magnifying glass, I can get you reading with glasses. So I wanna know what the level of vision is. Is there enough vision for me to help? There are some people that'll call and say, well, I have a problem only with my right eye. If the left eye is good, there's nothing I can do. I can't magnify the vision in this eye because then you see double. So that's why I talk to people on the phone. The second thing I wanna know is, what do you wanna be able to do? So do you wanna drive? Do you wanna read? Do you wanna watch TV? Do you wanna play cards, play bridge, read music? So now I can figure out, do you have enough vision for me to be able to get you to do what you wanna do? And the answer is yes, then you're coming in for an appointment. Then we spend an hour. So the first thing we do is go through the, the wish list. What do you wanna do? Um, you know, give me the more things you wanna do, the more things we can work on. Then I wanna know what the vision is. So I have charts, special charts to measure the vision. I don't use that eye chart that's 20 feet away that you can hardly see the, the E on. I use an eye chart that I can move closer to the patient, that I can move around. Because if the person is looking directly straight ahead, well, that's where the blind spot is. You're not going to see it. If we move the, the chart to the side, we can see if the vision is better. We can move the chart up, down, left, right, and get a much better sense of the amount of vision. So now I have the amount of vision and I have what the person wants to do. Now I have to figure out what the best way to do it is. Is the best way in glasses? Is the best way in handheld? Is the best way in electronic device? If the person wants to drive, well, the only alternative that I have is the bioptic telescope. Uh, if the person wants to watch TV, well, maybe you just sit closer to the TV or we go with telescope glasses. If they wanna read, well, you wanna bring it closer with strong reading glasses. So all of these items I have, and most low vision optometrists have, demonstrators in the office. So you're asking if this is heavy and whether the person can stand it. I have a pair of demonstrators exactly like this. They look the same, they feel the same, they're not focused properly for the person, but they're going on them in the evaluation to make sure that it's okay in terms of the weight and the cosmetics. There are some people that won't wear this because they don't like the way it looks. So we have demonstrators. That's one thing you wanna ask when you call up a low vision office. Do you have demonstrators? You must be able to put them on and feel what it feels like to know that it's not too heavy for you to deal with it. Otherwise, we don't want to order it. I don't want to order something and, and then have to send it back. So we, there's no guessing. So we have demonstrators of everything. So um, thank you for that question. Appreciate that. Okay, somebody's asking about visors that can help you see. Can you tell us about that? No, I can't because I really don't know what you mean by visors. Um, there are headborne devices with, with uh, 
lenses in there to magnify. I don't use them because the optics is not very good and the, the powers that they come in are very low. So I don't particularly use them. Again, I do an evaluation. We figure out exactly what a person needs and we design the glasses or the device for the person. What color sunglasses should I be using with vision loss is another question. Well, I'll tell you what not to use. You don't wanna use blue sunglass lenses because blue light coming into the eye has a lot of power to it and causes damage. So gray is fine, brown is fine, green is fine. I prefer brown just because it's personal preference, but gray is okay as well. You wanna make sure that it's 100% UV blockage, A and B. There's different types of UV. So A and B are the ones that you wanna block from getting into the eye. So you wanna make sure that it is 100% UVA, UVB, and either brown, gray, green, not blue. Are there any grants that can help pay for low vision equipment? A good question, not that I know of, although I know that there are Lions clubs that have been able to help people because Lions International, their uh, mission is uh, to help people with vision. Uh, so that is one. Other than that, I unfortunately, I don't know of any others. Okay, I have another question here. What about low vision telescope for trifocal people? Yeah, we can do that. We could put in a, a, a bioptic telescope, for example, with progressive lenses. We can put in a bioptic telescope with a, a single vision regular lens, a bifocal lens. Um, your low vision optometrist will design just about anything that will allow you to do what you wanna be able to do. Okay. Should I have an organization to come in to set up my home? Uh, this is a very good question because safety in the home is very important. There are occupational therapists who are trained to come into the home and work with you on keeping things safe and being able to help you do the things you wanna do. So for example, setting the oven. Uh, you could simply put a bump dot on 350 and then you know exactly how to set the oven. And there's many other little devices that will help. Um, if you have Medicare and you contact a home health agency in your area and ask if they have an occupational therapist that can come to your home, Medicare will cover the cost of a home health agency sending an occupational therapist to your home to help figure out how you can be safe and do the things you wanna do, cooking, uh, cleaning, all the tasks of daily living. Okay, what type of desk reader would I recommend? Oh boy, that's a tough question. I'm going to assume that we're talking about electronics. So there are handheld magnifiers that are electronic. Are there apps you can download to help with vision problems? Absolutely. Uh, many, many apps. Uh, in fact, I even have a couple on my phone. There is, uh, let's go here and take a look at it. So we go to vision. So there is one called Super Vision that uh, makes things larger. There's Super Vision Plus. There's seeing AI, this magnifying glass. So if you go to uh, your search and ask for uh, vision improvement, magnification, uh, you will see. If you go to Google and go to apps for uh, vision loss, uh, yeah, you're gonna find quite a few and it's uh, they're very good. On your iPad or your tablet, you can certainly make the fonts much, much larger. Uh, you can change the contrast, white on black, black on white. Um, the electronic devices that are sold for low vision change colors. So you can have blue on white and various other color combinations. So that will help too. Okay. 
We'll talk about some other strange things like, uh, for example, hemianopia. People have um, a stroke, half their field of vision is lost. Sometimes it's the right side, sometimes it's the left side. So in a case like that, there are two types of issues. One is people will lose half their side vision and they know it. So they know to compensate in order to make sure that they don't fall or knock something over or um, just be, have real problems getting around. At least they know that they've lost that side of their vision. But there are people who have something called neglect where they don't even know that it's missing. Uh, it's very strange, it's a very weird thing. If you ask them, for example, to draw a clock, they will draw half the circle and put all the numbers on one side and think that that's normal. It's very strange. So in working with a person with neglect, you first have to get them to recognize and understand that, um, that they've lost vision on that side. So, uh, that's it's very very funny, uh, but you've got to have you got to work with them. It's it's serious. And you've got to get them to just use bells, whistles, whatever it is. Vision therapists will work on that to get them to understand that they've lost vision on that side. Uh, with regard to what can we do about it, we can use prism glasses. Side awareness vision glasses is one type that was developed by. Uh, Dr. Rummel, a member of our organization, you put the prism on the side of the vision loss. And so you train the patient to look slightly into that part. Remember, if you look straight ahead, it's not there, it's gone. So if they look a little bit to the left into that prism, it shifts everything over and it tells them much more of what is there. It takes time to develop an awareness of how to use that. You really have to work at that to know because even though something may look, uh, a glass of water may look like it's over here, it isn't. Uh, that glass of water is actually over here, but the prism made it look like it's over here so that the person knew it was there. Uh, and since it's not really here, but it's over here, it takes quite a bit of time to uh, really understand and function that way. Uh, the second thing we can do, and we can do this for people with tunnel vision. Now, people with advanced glaucoma may experience tunnel vision where all they see is straight ahead. They may have 20-20 vision, but have no peripheral vision. So with that type of an issue, uh, Obviously, mobility is a very big issue because you, you, you can't see to walk around, you can't see below, you can't see steps, you can't see overhanging things. Um, so mobility becomes the major issue. One thing we do is refer patients to orientation mobility instructors. So orientation mobility instructors have college degree and master's degree level training in teaching people how to get around in the environment that we sighted people uh, put obstacles in their way, as they say. So they will teach people how to go around with cane, dog. Um, they also work with people who have mobility issues that are not vision, uh, leg problems, loss of limbs, um, artificial limbs. So those are people we refer to for people with tunnel vision, but there are visual aids that can help. So just like making things bigger helps a person with central vision loss, making things smaller actually helps a person with tunnel vision. So we can take this telescope and right now it's set up to magnify and we can turn it around and reverse it and have the person look this way and things actually will look smaller. When you look this way, things look bigger. You can see my eye in here, looks bigger. But if you reverse it, 
it will look smaller. So if it looks smaller, more of the room, for example, will fit in that telescope. So we can make a bioptic telescope because we can put the telescope on the top rather than on the bottom. And a person walks into a room and before they even go into the room, look through the telescope, everything is smaller, but they can scan the room and see what's there before they walk into it. Uh, or we could make it what's called a full diameter. We could put this telescope right in the middle reverse and a person can actually over time learn to walk around that way. Of course, everything looks, looks further away than it is. And so again, you're going to have a, a time of adaptation before you can get used to it. But there are things that can be done. So just so you understand, uh, seek the services of a low vision doctor if necessary. Other things that are happening for macular degeneration, uh, there's lots of studies being done for um, stem cells. Uh, we're not there yet, but the hope is that we can get stem cells to be implanted into the macular and have whatever cells that have been damaged in the macular revamped and come back and regenerate so that vision. But we're certainly not, not there yet. Oh, does iMed insurance cover low vision bioptic telescope? Okay, so a number of years ago, Medicare specifically stated that they don't cover low vision. They don't cover low vision exams. They don't cover low vision aids. Uh, why they did that, uh, there's a lot of reasons for mostly economic. And because Medicare does not cover low vision, neither do the supplementals. And when the supplementals won't cover it, excuse me, then most of the insurance companies will not cover it as well. So you'd have to talk to IMED, but I kind of doubt uh, that they would be able to cover low vision. So how do you pay for these things? Well, uh, a lot of doctors do have finance agreements, care credit, for example, um, could be done. It is an issue. Uh, there are some doctors that can take payments. Um, and there are other ways of handling things that could be less expensive. So if you need to see something at a distance and the bioptic telescope glasses are too expensive, there are handheld telescopes or handheld binoculars. You can even go online and purchase a pair of binoculars and then uh, hold them up and various powers. Um, you could go into a, a uh, even a Walmart or a store that has sales binoculars and try them out. So there are ways to get the magnification. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes, uh, you know, people say for a rainy day and sometimes that you've got to dip into the funds in order to be able to do it, in order to be able to see. It's a shame. Can we give you a ballpark price on a bioptic telescope? Uh, it's a good question. I'm going to say that there's somewhere between 2,500 and 3,500. Um, there are some newer types of bioptic telescopes that are even more than that. There is a range. Um, there, are, it really depends on so much. It depends on the level of power you need. It depends on the type of device. It depends on whether you need one or two. It depends on the prescription that has to go in. Uh, there are um, bioptic telescopes that, that are autofocus. So you can see at a distance, you can look up close, you can look at your computer, you can look here, and they'll automatically focus. Uh, there are ones that you can actually manually focus. So it really depends on a lot of factors. And the best thing is to talk to the low vision doctor uh, about your needs, and they can give you a price. Okay, question from Suzanne. If my dry macular degeneration turns to wet type and I begin to lose my vision, can you make bioptic telescopes or another type that will assist me to see, to drive, and even read? A very good question. Uh, 
First of all, you want to do everything you can to prevent dry turning to wet. Uh, one of the doctors in our group, a PhD in nutritional medicine, has suggested that high amounts of omega-3 is fish oil, cuts down the uh, risk of going from dry to wet. The second thing is you want to visit your retina doctor often because if it does turn from dry to wet, there are very, very good uh, medications now that could be administered to reduce the risk of vision loss. Wet means that there's some bleeding or fluid that has uh, leaked. And so there are injections. I know it sounds uh, annoying to have an injection in the eye, but they use anesthetic. So the injections will stop the bleeding and halt the vision loss. So really to a low vision optometrist, it doesn't matter what the diagnosis is. It doesn't matter whether it's dry macular degeneration, wet, star guards, which used to be called juvenile macular degeneration, uh, or any other type of uh, macular hole, whatever it is. The point is, how much vision do you have and what do you wanna be able to do with it? Driving is mostly a peripheral vision issue. Sometimes it becomes a depth perception issue when one eye becomes a problem and the other eye is better. So can a bioptic telescope help you to drive? I tell people that a bioptic telescope will make a safe driver safer. It will not make an unsafe driver safe. So to answer Suzanne, um, you want to you want to prevent it from going from dry to wet. If you can't, you want your retina doctor uh, to make sure that he's giving you whatever injections are necessary to stop the bleeding because the bleeding or that fluid will cause tremendous vision loss, a lot of damage. And then you want to visit your low vision eye doctor. So really macular degeneration patients need two eye doctors. You need a retina doctor to look at that macular, make sure everything is as, as good as it possibly can be, that's their job, and a low vision doctor to make you see as good as you can see, that's our job. Okay, so I have a question here. I have ischemic optic neuropathy on the right eye. My left eye is almost 20-20 vision. Do I need one right scope or both eyes? Well, the answer is you, read, you need nothing. Because if you're going to magnify the vision, just on one eye, you're going to see double. There's nothing we can do on that bad eye that's really going to make things improved, unfortunately. You have to rely on the good eye. Um, if the good eye is still not good enough that you want, then we would work with the, with the good eye. I always work with the better of the two eyes with the patient, unless the two eyes are pretty much the same. So what vitamins do I recommend for macular degeneration? Another very good question. Um, we know that lutein is a uh, antioxidant. It's, it's a nutritional that's found in the macular. So you wanna replace it because in macular degeneration, somehow it's lost. So you want lutein and zeaxanthine. Lutein, contains a little bit of zeaxanthine. So when you take lutein, you'll be getting a little bit of zeaxanthine. We know from the ARADS, age-related eye disease study, one and two, that vitamins A, C, E, copper, and zinc work. There's been a study that shows that beta carotene is not good because beta carotene competes with the lutein to get into the macula. And you don't want anything competing with the lutein to get into the macula. So you want to stay away from beta carotene. Uh, so the ARADS-2 study, there was a little bit of controversy over that with the omega-3, uh, but we definitely recommend omega-3 fish oil. And if you look at the label on, on your omega-3s, 
you'll see that there's a, an ingredient called DHA and EPA. They're very long names. I'm not going to say them now. DHA, EPA. You want the maximum amount you can find. So if you pick up two bottles of omega-3 and one has very low amounts of DHA and EPA and one has more, even though it says 1,000 on both bottles, you get the one with the most EPA and DHA. Um, I recommend about two or 3,000 IUs of omega-3s per day. Personally, I use Nordic Naturals because they make a very good natural product. Um, I personally recommend a product called Tozal, T-O-Z-A-L, for uh, my patients with macular degeneration because it's a product that has all of the uh, ARADs in it, plus the lutein, and it's all natural ingredients. So that is one that I particularly like, uh, but there are many others on the market. So that uh, hopefully gives you uh, the information you need on that. All right, I've also had people with uh, night blindness. That is a pretty uh, difficult issue as well. And uh, lately, um, a, a friend of mine, colleague of mine, Dr. Armstrong, pointed me to a company called Lead Lenser, L E D. Lenser, L-E-D-L-E-N-S-E-R, leadlenser.com, L-E-D-L-E-N-S-E-R. What do they make? They make flashlights. And they make the brightest flashlights I have ever seen. So a typical flashlight is about three to 400 lumens. This company makes flashlights that are 1,000, 2,000, 3,500, even 4,500 lumens in a handheld flashlight. Flashlight. So for people with uh, night blindness, I'm suggesting they go out and purchase one of these tremendously bright flashlights and shine it on the ground so that they're safer in being able to travel. Um, other than that, there's really not a lot that can be done, unfortunately, for night blindness. We do recommend orientation mobility instructors because, again, you've got to be able to be safe in getting around outdoors. Uh, you don't want to be stuck indoors the rest of your life at night. Uh, so we've had that type of an issue. All right, so if you have other questions, you can always email me or call me, it's not a problem. Uh, so if you want a copy of the vitamins I recommend, for example, you can uh, email me at doctor at lowvisioncare.com. The slide is right in front of you if you're looking at your computer, uh, or you can call me. If you call that number, you're probably gonna get my answering service, not a problem. Just leave your name and phone number or email address would even be better. Um, and I answer them. Emails I answer just about every single day. Phone calls I answer mostly on Mondays and Tuesdays when I'm available sitting here at my desk. Uh, but I'm happy to answer any questions anytime. It's not a problem. And I want to thank the MDA for having me. Very, very much appreciate the time to be able to, you know, make use of my knowledge and uh, take care of people. So thank you very much again.